Um, from Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife, and he's going to be talking to us about young and old forest parties for an ecologically functional landscape. All right, thanks. I want to uh, start with something that may not immediately seem like we're going to connect the forest, but we will get there. Uh, and that is uh, this uh, graph. That in Vermont, there's somewhere between uh, oh, 20 to 40,000 species that are here. And the mission of the Fish and Wildlife Department is the protection of all species and their habitats. So uh, we just have this small task of 20,000 to 40,000 species that fall uh, <laughs> to us to work on protecting for the people of Vermont. Uh, how do we protect them all? Well, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, we know a lot about some species, but not a lot about the vast majority of those species. So we're not going to go through and protect them one by one. We need a different strategy. And one strategy that we can use to deal with uh, that level of, that, you know, that magnitude of, of species out there is to use the coarse filter, fine filter approach to conservation, which is this approach that's been around for a while now that's uh, kind of well uh, recognized in the scientific literature and as a practical approach. Instead of going species by species, you find uh, other features on the landscape that will, uh, if they're protected, they'll bring along many other species. So I think you can picture this if you have an alluvial shrub swamp. Uh, you'll conserve alder and shrub willows. It'll be in there. Uh, you'll conserve uh, maybe veratrum, skunk cabbage. And you'll also conserve uh, habitat for species like wood turtles. If you can conserve those riparian areas, you'll have all those species. Same thing for a uh, black spruce swamp. You know, you don't have to worry about conserving black spruce because it's in that swamp. You don't have to worry about the many species of sphagnum moss because they're represented in that swamp. Their needs are met. You might also capture species like spruce grass or this moss uh, that grows only on moose dung. So, coarse filters, features of the landscape that work to conserve many species. By doing that, we don't need to go through and go one by one. There's probably many other species that I know nothing about, and maybe no one knows anything about, that will also be in these places if we conserve them. So over the past couple of years, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department and a number of partners have been working on essentially a, a big vision for well, what are all these coarse filters can we come up with a list of the best course filters uh, across the Vermont landscape that would work to conserve those 20 to 40,000 species and carry them forward even though we're facing uh, threats like habitat fragmentation and climate change? And the outcome of that work was this Vermont conservation design, this vision for a landscape that is based on all these different course filters. There are about 12 different course filters that stack up in this. And you can see there's uh, there are different scales from forest blocks, riparian areas, down to more specific pieces like natural communities, wetlands, grasslands, and, getting us on topic finally, young <laughs> old forest. So forest blocks are a key part of, of this conservation design and really just conservation in Vermont, Vermont's a forested state. This is a map of the forest blocks that come out as highest priority in this coarse filter design. Those alone would probably conserve many, many, many species if they were maintained as forest. But we know, because of Vermont's land use history, that this is what much of our forest looks like. It's not very structurally complex. It's a forest that has been cleared at one point about 100 years ago, and it's been growing back. It lacks uh, large trees. It lacks much diversity, you can see a long way through the understory. Uh, in some ways, it's great because it's a forest. But in other ways, it's really missing some of these components that really make for great wildlife habitat and that are really where you get uh, this great species diversity and ecological function. So as part of the conservation design, uh, we wanted to see if we could come up with targets for re-establishing a balance of forest uh, structures or age classes on the landscape. We have very little young forest and very little old forest. 
and can we bring those back by having some specific targets to aim for? So I want to talk about uh, both of those ends. I'll start with young forest, which is really if you're generating forest, uh, you know, at one time it was created mostly by natural disturbance, and now uh, what is out there is probably created mostly through logging, through uh, management. But it's, I think you can all picture this, you know, dense stands of saplings, trees that are 15 to 20 years old. Uh, young forest can be shade intolerant species like aspen, but it can also just be dense regeneration of uh, forest species like sugar maple or birch. Why we need more young forests specifically, and just for time here, I'm, I'm probably not going to do the why for either of these justice. But you know, they're part of our landscape. They support a suite of species, uh, especially birds. Uh, they're declining, and then you know, there's social values. These weren't really why we did this project, but I think it's important to point out that uh, these places are valued for their ability to produce wildlife. And then creating young forest is something we can actually go out and do, and we can actually make money while we do it. And that's cool and maybe unique among habitat management practices like this, where you can have such an immediate impact and make money. There's just those species again, uh, things like snowshoe hare, uh, towhees, grouse, woodcock, uh, chestnut sided warbler. There's 54 species of greatest conservation need that depend on young forest just in Vermont. So, we get to a target of 3 to 5% young forest. And that's informed by what was here prior to European settlement. Uh, at one time, that's an amount that supported all of Vermont's native species that depended on young forest. If we could get back to that, we could hopefully support those species. And you can see here, we're not, we're not there. We have a long way to go. This is just looking at that in Anchorage, thinking about this distributed around the state in different biophysical regions. What it would take to get us there. That's how many acres of young forest need to be created every year to get to that target. So, flip to the other side here. Old forests, uh, not necessarily old growth in that it's never been disturbed, but if our forests are allowed to grow and be self-willed and, and just do their thing, uh, we get to something like this. These very structurally complex forests, many different microhabitats, all sorts of big trees, down wood, snags. And it's that structure that makes them really valuable. And it's the forest that most of our native plants and animals evolved with. They're particularly resilient because of that diversity in them. And then they provide all these other social benefits, too, which, again, wasn't why we did this project, but I think it's important to, to call those out. The old, forest, the old forest target is about 10% of Vermont's forest. That's the easy number to remember. So if you want to like write one down, I think that's fair game. This is the actual way we got to this target. It's 15% of the matrix forest, these widespread forests, in that set of forest blocks I showed you at the beginning, which works out to that uh, 419,000 acres that would be distributed around the state. How did we get there? Well, it's professional judgment. Uh, we wanted to reintroduce those functions on the landscape, and this seemed like an amount that would be substantial enough to bring those functions back, but also be something we could get to. Luckily, it's consistent with other efforts like the um, Harvard Forest Wildlands and Woodlands project, which also came up independently with that same 10% uh, number. This is just showing you know, some examples of matrix forests and where they occur in that set of forest blocks I showed you at the start. And what's neat is we can actually go through and look at how we're doing by different forest types achieving uh, old forests. <coughs> so I should say we have essentially no actual old forest on the ground now. But we have forests that over time will become old because of their uh, management uh, uh, strategies or classification right now. So these are acres that are expected to become old forest. And then 
uh, how they divide up by biophysical region and by forest type. And the ones that I've highlighted in yellow are where we've met the target. Met meaning we'll likely have these acres as old forest at some point in the future. And everything that's not yellow are places where we could uh, still seek out more opportunities to increase that component on the landscape. Again, over time, we can't do anything to make forests older. There's great work being done to increase their structure, but it does not make them older. And so uh, this is really things that we just need to wait for nature to do its work. So uh, if you didn't add all those up in your head, what we get to is that we have 213 of that uh, 419,000 acres. Uh, so to complete that target, we'd need another 5 to 6% of Vermont's forest uh, to become old forest. So opportunities for new reserves. Sorry, I don't have the number for TNC's Burnt Mountain in here, so you can take 5,000 off that number thanks to that project. I think this is, is really helpful because um, really for both of these targets, this gives us a framework for, for pursuing both of these landscape features um, thoughtfully and strategically. We can think about biophysical region and forest type and be targeted in what we're, what we're striving to achieve on the landscape. So uh, I said that we were aiming for a balance, and I think that uh, I think that we've got a good balance in these numbers. And to to show you that in another way, uh, you need to bear with me on some math here. Uh, so this is for young forest, and this is if you want to create young forest through forest management and then create more young forest through forest management and keep cutting down trees to make that young forest. So let's say you want 4% of your landscape is young forest. Well, you gotta start and you gotta cut 4% of your landscape. And then it becomes zero to 15 years old. 15 years go by, now your forest is 15 years old. It's not young forest anymore. So you gotta cut another 4%. Another 15 years go, goes by, another four, and then you've got to cut another four, and another four, and finally, the very first place you cut on the landscape has become 90 years old. To do all of that, only 4% of your forest is young forest at any one time, but it's taken 24% of the overall forest to get that 4%. So that, hopefully you're sort of with me. So, uh, if you want to do a bigger target, 5, you need 30%. If you want 10% young forest, you need 60%. And so forth until, if you want 20% young forest, you can only grow trees to 75 years old if you want to be rotating through this. So uh, this is, I think, helpful perspective on what each of these numbers means in practice on the ground. So if we were to look at that balance, I think we've got... 25% of the landscape that is uh, working towards being young forest, 10% uh, of the landscape that's uh, old forest in the future, and then this, this great middle ground where there's all sorts of management opportunities that can uh, benefit all sorts of, of uh, ecological and social values. And so I think that this whole uh, set of targets really meets this goal of <coughs> providing a balance and bringing all of these ecological functions back to the landscape. So just some, some final thoughts. You know, I think we've, this design, if it was implemented, would, would restore these functions in this intact and connected landscape and, uh, you know, achieve these ecological goals. <coughs> this whole conservation design is a vision. It's not a mandate. These aren't targets that anyone's trying to impose on anyone. But they're out there as a vision for what we could do with the landscape. And, you know, I think we heard this earlier that Vermont's 80% private land so obviously, you know, this depends on, on what landowners choose to do in their decisions. Uh, but that, you know, in the end, it's something that we could do. And if we do, it supports uh, species, wildlife, ecological function, and so much of Vermont's social and economic value. So that's what I've got. Thanks.
Bob, uh, this is really helpful, and I love that chart. Of, um, but I was wondering, you know, in the old forest target of 10%, it's, you're sort of treating all of it equally across the landscape, and we know that like a lot of that is weighted to higher elevation forests, and I, I don't know if you want to just comment on that. That's, that's great. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, let me go back to, to this graph. So that's right. A lot of our current conserved lands where there's no management is biased towards high elevations, right? No one's cutting timber on the top of Camel's Hump, uh, and I don't think we're ever going to. But we don't want to have just all of our old forest in, uh, in spruce fir. We want to have examples of different forest types represented. So we also want to have northern hardwood forest and uh, red oak northern hardwood forest. So I think that's where this table, where we can look at how we're doing with the different natural communities and what we have can be helpful. And I think at this point we're, except for the Southern Green Mountain region, where I think we have, uh, let's see, I think this is actually slightly over the proportional uh, goal if you were to divide those up among the region. Uh, but everywhere else we're so far below that we have, we have room to, to have more old forest in all the different community types before we run into the problem of too much of any one type. Yeah. It, it would appear to me that the old growth forest is going to have to be in fairly large tracts and as well protected from fires <coughs> and, and other areas. Most of which, first of all, are going to occur on public lands. And secondly, it appears that private landowners are not going to own enough money or have the affordability to, to, to actually not manage the forest. If you find that you're not creating this much forest on private land that you say you need, is the state willing to go and create it on their own land? Yeah, great question. For the first part, uh, I, I neglected to mention this, but the goal is wherever possible to have these in 4,000 acre or bigger blocks. In some part of the state, some parts of the state, that's just not going to be possible. So, you know, smaller where needed. But yeah, so we have some guidelines for what would be a great size. Uh, I don't know that I totally, totally agree that private landowners can't do this. There's groups like the Northeast Wilderness Trust that are purchasing conservation easements specifically for the purpose of creating old forest over time. And they seem to have landowners who are willing to uh, pursue that route. But uh, I think that's also the case, yeah, that public lands will play a large role in this. And we know that on our public lands, even places where we, we do timber management, there's uh, large chunks of forest that we're not managing. And, you know, Camel Stump is a great example where I think we're managing only 30% of the overall ground in that 25,000 acres. So there's, uh, what is that, you know, some 20,000 acres that are going to become old forest in a variety of different uh, natural community types. It's time for like, one more question. Yeah, Jane. Yeah. Bob, I understand. Um, you know, over time, how you keep on moving around and create the 4% target for young forests. Is there any idea how much we are generating through natural disturbance on an annual basis? I, maybe someone else does, but I, I don't have a good sense. What I, what I do think is that our younger, like middle-aged forest, because it's not structurally diverse, I think it's less prone to natural disturbance. So if it was all old forest, I think we'd get 3 to 5% natural. But the way it is now, I think we don't have trees dying. They're not susceptible, as susceptible to grow down. So I think we just have a lower rate of disturbance. But what it is, is I don't know. Okay. Thank you so much.